2018 Distinguished Lecture Series, May 11th Program, The Naval Art of Arthur Beaumont, presented by Jeffrey Beaumont. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Our speaker this evening, uh, Jeffrey Beaumont, actually reached out to us, um, Michael, our Executive Director, and me, uh, almost a year ago, I think, and told us a little bit about his dad, Arthur. And I didn't know anything about Arthur Beaumont, and I was so excited to have lunch with Jeffrey when he told us about his dad's career. And he has been so incredible working with the museum and facilitating uh, us getting the loan of this beautiful piece of artwork here that was done by his father. If you have not been in the museum to see it, please take a chance to come up and see it up close this evening while it's here right in front of all of you. It's, it's just a beautiful piece of uh, one of the atomic bomb tests uh, done in the Pacific, uh, Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, it's, we're so thrilled to have it, and we're so thrilled for Jeffrey's support, and he, he, hopefully we're gonna have some more of these, too, on loan coming uh, in the next year or so. So stay tuned for info on that, and I'm just gonna turn it over to Jeffrey because he has all of the good info on his father. So thank you so much for being here this evening. I think that'll work. Can you hear me okay in the back? Well, thank you, Jordan, and thank you, uh, Michael, for having me here. I am so happy uh, to be here. Last night, I gave a speech in Tucson to the Cruiser Sailors Alumni Association, and there were 140 people for dinner, and uh, there were about 80 men who served on cruisers, and 75% of them saw their ships in paintings on the screen last night. So I'm going to take you through that, and you'll see the same ones. Now, what is the, the legacy of uh, Arthur Beaumont, my dad? Number one, he was born in 1890. He was born in England, and he came to the United States when he was 18 years old. How large is the legacy? Well, it's, in fact, the largest legacy of Navy paintings that exists in the history of the United States Navy. When my father was 84 years old, my sister did an oral history with him. He's telling about his life. And at some point she said to him, well, Dad, how many paintings in your lifetime, finished studio paintings, have you done? And he looked at her and he kind of glowered. He said, I'm not an accountant. <laughs> and he wasn't, he had no idea how many paintings he'd done. But in the background on the audio, we don't have video, just audio, you can hear my mom. And she says, well, Bo, I paid the taxes. So my mom was the accountant, and she's the one that made the estimate of how many paintings were in the body of work. And it came up at around 1,200 finished studio works in a lifetime of painting. About 90% of those are navy, and about 95% of the paintings are watercolors, which were, he was particularly adept at doing watercolors. The reason he focused on watercolors was because you could not take the solvents necessary to do oil painting on board ship because they were flammable. And so watercolors became this vehicle. It was also more portable, so it, it was convenient. But in his lifetime, he also did quite a number of oils. I'll see if I can get this to work properly. So here's an image of my dad that was done uh, when he was around 60 years old. He was nominated for the National Academy of Artists. And to be a member of the Academy, you have to have a portrait done of you by another artist. So this is the official painting for that purpose. And it's not a painting, it's actually a charcoal, but it's a very good likeness. So taking you back now, let's go back to when he was in England. And here he is as an 18-year-old. He's graduated from high school, and uh, he's contemplated going to college, to university but he doesn't have the economic substance of his family to, uh, to support him to go to college, and he doesn't have uh, the social status that you needed in England in 1908. So my, his brother, my uncle William, had the same problem four years before, and William solved the problem by immigrating to the United States and was <coughs> enrolled as a uh, university student studying engineering at the University of California, Berkeley, in the Bay Area. And, and my Uncle William was on campus in 1906 
when they had the earthquake. He was part of the engineering team that was set up to evaluate the structural integrity of the buildings on the Berkeley campus, which were built, better built than most. And they were being used as refugee centers for the people coming over from the burning city from San Francisco by ferry boat. So he had quite an experience there. But he's writing to my father and he's saying, the university life here is really exceptional and it's free. So my dad decides he's going to make the journey as well. Now he had one advantage. While he was still in England, he was a member of the Army Reserve Cavalry Corps. And this was, he's in the middle of this group right here. And he's 17 years old. And he became a very accomplished horseman. That became important because when he got to, to the Western Hemisphere, he all kept running out of money to go to art school. And his backup was he became a cowboy. And so his early art, you will see very shortly, uh, as a cowboy. So here he is dressed in his cowboy outfit. He's 22 years old. And he, he, he spent about a year and a half, almost two years, at the Berkeley in art school, or conference art school, ran out of money. And one of the uh, officers of the university knew the owners of the largest ranch in California, the Miller Lux Ranch. They offered him a job as a ranch hand. And this is the job he took in order to earn money to, to return art school. So he went down to the Central Valley of California and uh, he worked for the Miller Lux Ranch. And he worked as an assistant superintendent on a 50,000 acre cattle ranch. In pursuit of his duties, he discovered some cattle rustlers were stealing, it was a gang that was stealing cattle off the ranch. He brought in the sheriff, they apprehended two men, uh, he took them to jail, he testified against them, and they were sentenced to prison. But it was an Italian family, and they swore a vendetta against Bo. And uh, as a result, he, uh, he was beaten very badly by some of the cousins of the people who were in jail. He was almost killed. And he had uh, damage to his, uh, his hearing, he had damage to his brain. He had to have brain surgery in San Francisco in 1910, which is, you can imagine what that was like. And uh, he survived that. And he went back to the ranch, and while he was there, it was, people were still shooting at him. So he told the sheriff of his experience, and the sheriff said, I forgot to tell you, by the way, he was born Arthur Edwin Crabb. Our family name was not Beaumont. It became Beaumont at this time. So the sheriff said to Bo, get out of town and change your name. So he changed the family name from Crabb to Beaumont. That made me, gave me my name. And uh, he moved to Los Angeles, where he shortly met my mother. So his early paintings are in the Western style, as you can see. And this is a self-portrait of a cowboy with a beautiful uh, mountain scene, Western mountain scene behind it. When he arrived in Los Angeles, 1915, he met my mother. And uh, Dorothy Dean, she was uh, uh, quite attractive, I think. And uh, she was also an outstanding student. And when she finished her college education at UCLA, she graduated as the first female valedictorian of the university in 1927. And she was the first Phi Beta Kappa for UCLA. And they hired her as assistant dean of women for UCLA, which was significant in my dad's career in later years. While he was courting uh, Dorothy, he did, he did sketches, little love notes. That's Cupid. And there she is again. After, after it, the courtship was a very strained one because my, my grandfather did not like the idea of his only daughter being married to a, an itinerant, unemployed artist from England. So it took a while for, it, uh, for that courtship to work out, but he was, he, he was very persistent and eventually did work out. In 1921, he enrolled back in art school at the Chouinard Art Institute in Los Angeles. And Mrs. Chouinard picked him out as one of the most promising of the uh, students at that time. She arranged for him to have a fellowship to go back to Europe. So he returned to Europe and went to England. He went to the University of London, the Slave School of Art, very High, high, highly rated art institute, and he also went to the Academy Julienne in Paris. So 
So here's a picture of, of a sketch that he made of the front door of his art academy in Paris. And here he is in Paris uh, with the Notre Dame in the background. When he came back from Europe in 1920, late 1926, he went back as a, a professor at uh, Chouinard Art Institute. And by 1929, he decided he had enough uh, backing that he could set up his own studio. So here's his own, his own studio. He made it like a sketch bit. And uh, he opened this in August of 1929. Well, that was bad timing because the stock market crashed in October of 1929 and it destroyed the art market completely. So in the pro process after that, he couldn't go back to his job. He, oh, he closed the studio in, in March of 1930, and he couldn't go back to his job, the Art Institute, because the position had been filled. So uh, my mother got him a job in charge of art uh, productions, art design for UCLA publications. My mom, at this point in time, was the assistant dean of women at UCLA. And at that time, he was also painting paintings in the French style. So here's a painting of my sister called Little Mother, it's, um, she's seven years old there, and she's not holding a baby, she's holding a doll. So she is the little mother. And he was doing uh, landscape paintings in the style of California Impressionists. And that meant that these were plein air artists. It meant they went to the location where the scene was, and they painted what they saw. So here he is doing a mountain scene, and this is the type of painting that would result from that mountain scene. He's doing these paintings in the early 1930s, during the early years of the Depression, but nothing is selling, so it's kind of piling up in the inventory. He also did precious paintings of sailing ships, and this is before he got introduced to the Navy. So you can see he's very impressionistic, and he was doing seascapes, California seascapes, and he did one religious painting, which was an altarpiece for the uh, Episcopal Church in Point Hope, Alaska, the northernmost Episcopal Church in the world. He also was giving classes in the harbor and doing regular uh, watercolors of harbor scenes. He loved uh, all the boats that he saw there, and he particularly liked fishing boats. He liked the complexity of them, the design of them, the colorations. These were scene paintings, and he loved to do the wave action. Was, that became one of his trademarks in later years. And also his colorations were very visible. So in 1931, it was announced that UCLA will be the sponsor of the 1932 Olympics. And because he was head of art direction for UCLA at that time, he got the position of doing the Olympic posters for 1932. So what he did was he designed a series of every city that had hosted the Olympics from 1896 in Athens to Paris in 1900, St. Louis 1904, London 1908, Amsterdam 1912, in Stockholm, uh, he did uh, the city in Belgium as well. So he did a total of nine and plus Los Angeles. I picked one image to put in, the, in my book, which is the image of London because my dad was English. But this is, uh, is what the Olympic poster for 1932 was. When we had the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles, we loaned them all of these posters and they integrated them into the publicity uh, for that event. And now, as you know, you see, uh, Los Angeles has been selected for the Olympics coming up after Paris and uh, we'll be using these same posters once again. So in 19, early 1930s, he's doing these harbor scenes, but if you look very closely at this one, what do you see in the background? On the right-hand side, the left-hand side, you see the United States fleet. For the first time, this is before he was the artist of the Navy, he's painting Navy ships. And one of the captains of the battleship Arkansas, who was an art collector, saw his work and said, do you do portraits? I'd like you to do my portrait. He said, it's 1932, 1933, I'll do anything. <laughs> so here you are. He's in the admiral, he's in the captain's cabin. There's the captain sitting for it. Bo did not work from photographs. He insisted that people who did portraits don't have to sit for him so he could study their personality and do different aspects of uh, his studies. So here you see the portrait. You see, he's in the cabin, captain's cabin. And this captain also um, had him do paintings of the ship. So here's a very extraordinary painting of the ship. It's, a, it's really a scene painting, a Navy scene painting, but it's the battleship done from the underside while it's in dry dock. You see all the workers that work there. But if you look at it very carefully on the upper right, it's a very abstract painting. 
So he's mixing modern art techniques with the traditional Navy subjects, unlike any other artist before him had done. Well, Captain uh, Percy Foote of the Arkansas introduced him to Admiral William Leahy. Now, Leahy was a battle fleet commander in Long Beach and ultimately became head of the Navy. So Leahy said, well, would you do a portrait of me? So this is a study that he did for one of Leahy's portraits. He did three portraits of Leahy. Leahy became the highest ranking military officer in World War II, and he was the first officer to achieve five-star rank. So he was senior to Eisenhower, and MacArthur, and Nimitz, and all of those names that are so uh, memorable from World War II. But Leahy was Roosevelt's principal chief and military advisor. He was effectively, during the war, the first uh, joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and he didn't have that title at that time. That was an after-war title. <clears throat> so here's the official portrait of Leahy as it finally came out, that hangs in the Naval Academy today. In 1933, the USS Constitution, the oldest ship in the US Navy, had been restored. They'd had a, a national campaign where children collected pennies. They added up all these pennies and they rebuilt the Constitution. As a reward for that success of that campaign in 1933, they towed the ship to all the major ports in the United States, including coming through the Panama Canal and coming to California for the only time. So in 1933, the Constitution is in San Diego, Long Beach, San Francisco, and Seattle. And here's a painting of the, of the Constitution in a Long Beach Harbor with the battleship Pennsylvania in review. So my dad did a whole series of paintings while it was in Long Beach. And then the ship was there, for, I think about a million people were on board the ship in Long Beach. When it went to San Francisco, it was met with a similar acclaim. And uh, he painted several paintings, and he took one of them to San Francisco to, uh, to, to deliver it to the Secretary of the Navy. So here's an oil painting of the Constitution. There's my dad on the left. There's the Secretary of the Navy on the right. And in the background is the mayor and the governor of California in top hats and cutaways to uh, kind of set the scene. So that's San Francisco Harbor, 1933. Now about that same time, Admiral Leahy said to him, why don't you paint for the Navy? He said, oh, the official artist of the Navy from World War I had died in the late 1920s. The Navy had no artist by 1930, 31, 32. And he saw that, uh, that Bo had this considerable capability and he had a particular interest in ships. So uh, he made him the offer to make him a lieutenant and to make him part of Navy intelligence. So in 1932, he got his commission and he went to sea for the next two years, 1933, 1934. And he used, uh, again, he does not use photographs, so you'll see him on the scene doing plein air paintings. Here he is doing a drawing of the Indianapolis, an ill-fated ship that we'll comment on at some length because of its history. And here's an original drawing. These are the types of drawings he used to make his paintings. Well, this ship was particularly important in his history because in 1934, they had the fleet review in New York Harbor, and President Roosevelt was holding that review. His flagship that he chose was the Indianapolis. So Bo had already painted the Indianapolis on several occasions, and Bo was uh, on board at the time of the fleet uh, review. So here he is in uniform with his sketchbook, and he is on the deck of the USS Louisville, a sister ship of the Indianapolis, and in the background is the Indianapolis itself. Now Roosevelt was not on board at this time, but the next day uh, he came on board. He was going to go out into the river, and the entire fleet was going to parade in front of him, and he to salute him. And uh, Bo had a private audience with the president, and a painting that was commissioned by Captain Smeely of the Indianapolis and was given to by the ship's compliment to the president. So he had a private audience with, with President Roosevelt, uh, just the president there, his son Elliot there, and the captain in the cabin. They had quite a long chat about the history of the Indianapolis at that time, which was one of the fastest ships in the Navy. So here's a finished painting of the Indianapolis, which is in the Irvine collection. This is a painting that I gave to the Irvine Museum. And here's a painting of the Indianapolis with the Amberjack. This is the painting that was given to President Roosevelt. That was one of his yachts in the foreground. And uh, you can see the painting is somewhat degraded. 
and there's quite a history to this. Roosevelt left this painting on board the Indianapolis, so when he came back and it was his flagship, it would be there in his cabin. It stayed on board for several years. When the war broke out in 1942, the Indianapolis was posted from the Atlantic Fleet to the Pacific Fleet to reinforce the fleet after the attack and the losses at Pearl Harbor. So the, the ship went through Pearl Harbor after the attack, was stripped down for battle, and sent out to the Western Pacific. We thought that this painting was still on board at that time. And we thought that in, subsequently when Indianapolis was sunk, we thought the painting went down with the ship. Now the history of the sinking is quite tragic. The Indianapolis, being one of the fastest ships in the Navy, was selected in 1945 to carry the atomic bomb from Oakland to Kwajalein Island and then to transship it to Tinian Island, where it was put on the Enola Gay to take it to Hiroshima. The bomb was on board and the ship was sent by itself, detached from fleet, the fleet, on a secret mission at full speed all the way across the Pacific. It did not stop in Hawaii on the way. It delivered the bomb and coming back from Tinian, it was sunk by a Japanese submarine. There were 1,100 men on board. 300 went down with the ship, sank in five minutes. About 800 men went in the water and because it was such a secret mission, none of the fleet commanders knew that the ship had been lost. So there was no search, and men went in the water. Luckily, it was warm water, but it was, there were lots of sharks as well. The men stayed in the water for over four days when a PBM, a, a PBY, a, a search plane, by accident, looking for downed uh, pilots, happened to see the debris in the water, came closer, saw men in the water, called in more uh, seaplanes, and brought in more ships, and they were able to rescue about 350 men out of the total of 1,100 who had been on board. So a very tragic case. So this painting disappeared, and we thought it was gone. Forty years later, I was invited to Hawaii by the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet. He was Admiral Hayward. He was giving a, a, an award to my brother for work that he did on Naval, uh, for Navy Relief. So I went to this event. We went to the Admiral's office. He had a Beaumont painting on the wall, which was not at all unusual for senior offices in the Navy to have. And he said, I've arranged a special trip for you. You and your brother, if you would like, can have a one-day trip on a nuclear submarine. I've been in the Navy for six and a half years, but I had never been on a nuclear submarine. So we were quite excited about the opportunity. So the next day, we went to the Admiral's office at the submarine base. I walked in the Admiral's office, and above his desk was a painting of the Indianapolis, this painting. So this painting had been taken off the ship without recording it in 1942 and had been in the submarine commander's office this whole time without the people in Washington knowing the painting even existed. So we recaptured the painting. But you can also see the reason it's degraded is because it was, it's a watercolor. It was in non-air conditioned space for many years and the humidity levels were too high and the painting, the painting sort of melted a little bit. But it's so historic that uh, we had to show it. So in the mid-1930s, uh, Bo is still doing portraits. And here you have a, uh, a classic, uh, this is a Marine Corps colonel, who later on became a lieutenant general. And in the 1930s, he continued to start painting the, the ships of the fleet. So here you have the USS Saratoga. And if you look closely, look at the type of plane he's launching. It's a biplane. So this is the very beginning of naval aviation. And this is one of the, I think this is the third carrier that was made. The first carrier was the Langley, which was a converted to Collier. The second uh, carrier was the Ranger. And the third carrier was the Saratoga. So here's a picture of the Ranger also about the same time coming through the Panama Canal. It's one of my favorite paintings because it's uh, so beautifully done and shows a very mature style. This is done in 1933. And that same trip, this is a picture of the Lexington also coming through. This is a sister ship of the Saratoga. And uh, you may have heard that the, the, the wreck of the Lexington, which was sunk in the Battle of the Coral Sea, has been found uh, off uh, the coast of Australia. And uh, that was found by Paul Allen's group only about uh, two months ago. So it's quite extraordinary that they, uh, uh, they can't dive on the wreck, though, because it's in about 3,000 meters of water. But at the same time, the uh, Bo was painting ships of the Asiatic fleet. You can see here Chinese uh, sampans in the foreground. 
And he was doing Navy recruiting, so he would do Navy posters. You can see here Teddy Roosevelt, the father of the American fleet, great white fleet. And you'll see in the foreground, uh, right off his shoulders, a submarine, a battleship, and an aircraft carrier in the background. So these were used for recruiting purposes in the recruiting offices all across the country. And then he would just do paintings that had a great deal of drama. Here you have scout planes from the battleship uh, Tennessee down below. These are amphibious planes. Uh, they were catapulted off the battleship. They, were then, they didn't have radar in those days. They would go out ahead of the ships and try and scout uh, for enemy ships. And then they would come back, land in the water, and there was a, a, a crane on the ship that would put them back on board. So these were not carrier-based. They were based on a uh, battle fleet. In 1934, almost 35, Bo realized that if he stayed in the Navy as a regular officer, all the paintings that he did belonged to the Navy. Just a, a photographer who's working in the Navy, all the photography would belong to the Navy. So what he did, he, he was very clever. He joined, he resigned his commission, regular Navy commission, and he joined the California Naval Guard. And that was a, a it, it was a reserve unit in Los Angeles, so he was able to attend the, the uh, various sessions that they had in Los Angeles and also maintain his studio. In that way, the paintings that he painted were his to keep. So he would barter with the Navy and said, if I go on this expedition, I'll give you six paintings, but the rest of them I keep. And he could sell to a private clientele. And all the Navy officers, the senior officers, almost all the captains of the ships, if you've got a major appointment to a ship, you wanted to have a Beaumont painting. It was just kind of the come-to guy to do all that. So in this, in this reserve unit, he also met John Ford, the movie director. And John Ford uh, became a very good friend. My dad became one of his drinking buddies. And that led, of course, to an introduction to John Wayne, who was one of the, art one of the artists that worked with John Ford. So here's a picture of John Ford's yacht, the, the Ariner. And that's where a lot of the drinking went on. This, big, this uh, ship was in the long, uh, San Pedro Harbor. But John Ford introduced Bo to a number of other movie people. And he was commissioned to do the artwork for a movie called Mutiny on the Bounty. So that was done in 1934. And in 1935, uh, Mutiny on the Bounty won the Academy Award as Best Picture. And here you have a picture of Bo on board the deck of the Bounty with Clark Gable, dressed as Fletcher Christian. And in the center is Ethan Head, who's a, a woman with, uh, with quite a reputation doing costumes for the, for the movies for over a long career. <clears throat> At the same time, he would punctuate his career Bo would punctuate his career every now and then by doing self-portraits. So here's a portrait done about that time. And he continued to do non-Navy subjects as well as Navy subjects. Here's a harbor scene of the Navy Pacific liner leaving for the, for the uh, Far East. And he did a, a, a series of, of portraits of, of the yacht, a few yachts, five yacht paintings, all of rather famous people. The Aerator was John Ford's. He also did John Wayne's yacht, the Wild Goose. And this is the picture of Howard Hughes' yacht, uh, which was the largest of all. And here you see it in, uh, in dry dark. By the late 1930s, he continues to paint all the battleships of the United States Navy. So all the ships that were later sunk in Pearl Harbor are photographed, uh, are painted. Uh, and he went on board all of them. This is the USS California. This is the USS Oklahoma. This is a painting that was in my collection. I gave it to the Arizona Memorial. At the time, it had a notation on the back of the a drawing of, of a painting, which I think was in my father's handwriting, that said, uh, it, it said, this is the uh, Arizona. And so I gave it to the museum on the premise that it was the Arizona. And in fact, it was not. It was the Oklahoma. And they were delighted to have the painting because they had many paintings of the Arizona. They had no paintings of the Oklahoma. And this is the one that suffered the second largest casualties after the Arizona at Pearl Harbor. You may remember this, if you've seen the pictures of Pearl Harbor, this is the ship that turned over and caught so many men inside when they drowned. So we get now up to the late 1930s. These are these more battleship paintings. This is the New Mexico and the uh, of West Virginia. And here's an oil painting of the battleship Pennsylvania. If you, it's quite different if you'll notice it. It's painted in the California plein air style, uh, which means impressionist style. The first ship, the lead ship, is very detailed, but the other ships, as you can see, are just suggested. 
this is a painting that's uh, in my collection, and uh, I think it's one of the most beautiful that I have. It is a, uh, it's an oil, as opposed to almost all the other paintings I've showed you, are watercolors. And here's a painting recently discovered of the USS Arizona, painted in 1940, one year before Pearl Harbor. So in late 1939, um, Bo had met uh, William Randolph Hearst through John Ford, and he'd been invited to go up to San Simeon, where they had some of these wild parties that Hearst would give. Marion Davies was a good friend of my dad's. And uh, in 1939, William Randolph Hearst hired Bo to be the chief illustrator for the uh, Hearst publications across the country. And so he was to make oil, he was to make watercolor ink drawings of the battle scenes that were coming in by teletype from Europe. They had no images to go with it. So the teletypes would come in, you would say, you know, the sinking of the Graf's Bay in Montevideo, or the sinking of the Hood by the Bismarck, or later on the sinking of the Bismarck. All these stories came in without any images. So Bo would get these my messenger would get the stories and he would envision what the scene was like and it would appear, do a painting of four hours in black and white and it would be photographed and be on the front page of the newspaper. So here's an example of, of two German ships, Nazi ships, and they have just uh, attacked a, a, um, a merchant ship you can see in the background burning. So this is the type of image that appeared. Here's an image of the British battleship Hood the largest battleship in the British Navy, which one month after this painting was appeared in the newspaper, the hood was sunk by the Bismarck with almost total loss of life, about 2,400 men. This is the last uh, uh, paint portrait that would have been done of that ship. And he also did uh, scene paintings. So here you have Navy guys, so you can see them at work on board ship. In 1940, uh, Admiral Leahy had been retired as head of the Navy. He was appointed as American ambassador to British, to, to the French Vichy government, Marshal Pétain. This is the part of, of uh, France that was not occupied by the Nazis. Paris had fallen to the Nazis, and the assignment of Admiral Leahy was to try and keep the French Navy from going over to the Russia, to the German, German side, which would have changed the balance of power against the British Navy. So Admiral Leahy was there to try and negotiate that. <clears throat> the ship that he took to Europe was the current flagship that uh, Brosnov had taken, called the Tuscaloosa. So here's an image of the Tuscaloosa. This is a, a lithographic image that Admiral Leahy commissioned for Bo to do as a gift for President Roosevelt for loaning him his flagship to take him from Norfolk, Virginia to Lisbon and then on to France. Here's a picture of the bedroom for Franklin Roosevelt at Hyde Park. And if you'll notice on the upper right, there's the image of the Tuscaloosa, a treasured, uh, uh, something that he uh, uh, treasured, a gift from Admiral Leahy. When I went to see the, uh, this image in Hyde Park, it's a national park, and I identified myself to the guy and said my father did that piece. She invited me in because the room was roped off. And I walked across the room. And she went over and she took this off the wall and she handed it to me which I'm sure you're not supposed to do that, but you know, I've got it in my hands, it's only about that big. And I was able to see that there was Roosevelt's signature in live, and my father's signature next to it. So that it said that there'd been a presentation where the two of them had been there when they had, uh, uh, it had been given by Admiral Leahy. So that, it's not in the National Park, it will always be in that location. Now we can, the war is about to break out, and in the US, we're watching what's happening in Europe. The Nazis have taken over most of Europe. The Japanese are acting up in the Pacific. And there, there are a number of military people on the board of the National Geographic magazine who see the war is coming. And so they want the National Geographic to do something to accentuate the, uh, the war effort before the war broke out. So <clears throat> the head of the Navy, former head of the Navy, uh, got the National Geographic to commission him to do nine paintings that would be published in the magazine. These paintings were done in 1941 and were published in the September 1941 issue, three months before Pearl Harbor. And they depicted, it was called the Ships that Guard Our Ocean Ramparts. They depicted, depicted the different types of ships in the Navy. So here was a heavy cruiser, the Astoria, naval aviation, seaplanes, 
the destroyer force. These were quite large paintings, they were all watercolors. The auxiliary force, these were the boilers, submarine force, and the very popular PT boats. You'll notice these PT boats have anti-aircraft bubbles amidship. Those were taken off in the Pacific because it was too warm in the Pacific. They had to have open turrets. They couldn't, the men couldn't survive in the heat that they were created. So the PT boats that Kennedy uh, commanded were different than these. But they, this is the basic hull, but the superstructure was different. And the final painting is, uh, well, this isn't the final painting, but the paintings of aircraft carriers at the time, 1941, and the painting that I selected for the cover of the ship of my book, the uh, in New Mexico. So in 1941, at Pearl, the time of Pearl Harbor, <clears throat> two of the Army people on board the, the board of the National Geographic saw that the Navy had gotten a lot of publicity out of these Navy uh, ship paintings tremendous response from the public. So they said, well, we have to have an army series. So you had General John Pershing on the board. He was the head of the American Expeditionary Force in Europe in World War I, highest ranking officer in World War I. And you had General Hap Arnold, who later became head of the uh, Army Air Corps. Those two generals lobbied to have National Geographic do a series by bow of army scenes but they wanted it to be larger and more impressive than the Navy scenes had been. So the Navy series had been nine paintings, and the Army commissioned 16 paintings. These paintings were, he was working on them the week of Pearl Harbor. He was down on maneuvers with General Patton and General Eisenhower in the southeast United States where they had live action. Uh, they, were, they were testing the Army under live action conditions, and Bo was there doing a blend their art. So, here you have the 1942 issue of the National Geographic, and here you have Bo at work as an army outfit. So here he is painting an, an artillery, uh, I guess a combat group, and here's the actual painting from that. And he did all sorts of scenes of the army at work. So here you have maybe army nurses, you have the ski corps, and he did sketches of everything in sight. These are listening devices to detect airplanes, searchlights that they used at the beginning of the war before they had radar. And uh, he, he published the series in the middle of 1942, again to great acclaim. It made him very famous. He also was doing more war work, uh, more movie work, and he worked on a movie called Wake Island. And this is the, uh, the valiant attempt by the American Marines and the uh, Navy to defend the island of Wake at the time of Pearl Harbor. It was unsuccessful. Wake was captured by the Japanese. But the next island was Midway Island, and that was a different story. It was in the Battle of Midway, we turned back to the Japanese for the first time. So we were looking for something. Pearl Harbor had already occurred. We were looking for some way to counterattack. <clears throat> so the Navy and Army got together and decided that they would try and do a raid on Tokyo. Now, it's only four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. But this, this is a, a painting of the famous Jimmy Doolittle raid. Here you had the American carrier Hornet. And in this case, it was launching army planes because they were longer range. Now, they couldn't come back and land on the aircraft carrier. They could only take off. And it wasn't even clear they could make it to Japan. But in fact, it's a very famous story. They did. Here's a secret photograph that was taken of the army planes about to take off. And you can see how crowded the deck is. He just barely had enough room to get off that ship and then drop the bombs on Tokyo. It was a very famous raid. <clears throat> in 1942, Bo was asked to organize the war bond campaign to build the cruiser Los Angeles. The studio was in Los Angeles and he knew many of the people there. So he did a series of lithographs which were given out to people who bought large denominational war bonds. So here he is signing the, the, uh, signing the uh, individual lithographs, and here's one of the posters. These posters were all over the city to raise money and build the cruiser in Los Angeles. So the cruiser, the Navy wanted to have a light cruiser, and it was going to be, uh, uh, it was going to cost $41 million to build it, so that was the goal. The campaign was so successful, it raised $80.5 million. The Navy responded by saying, well, we'll build a heavy cruiser instead of a light cruiser. 
and uh, they went on to finish the cruise in Los Angeles. They also built four escort ships, and they were very, very pleased with, with the success of it. So they commissioned Bo to do an oil painting for the city hall, uh, which hung in the city hall for some 25 years, in the rotunda of the city hall. And during the war years, he did paintings of the ships at battle. Here's a painting of the uh, USS Baltimore under Kamikaze attack at Okinawa. He suffered very heavy losses. The Kamikazes were extremely effective and lost a lot of ship and a lot of men to them before we put a defense in place. And we were also, he did other World War II ships. Here's a picture of New Jersey, one of our largest battleships. And here's a picture of a little known destroyer called the USS English. This was the ship that I served in when I was in the Navy, and uh, I was there many years after the war. But I told my dad, I got seasick on board this ship. I said, when you do my ship, I want you to give me a really vigorous sea. So here you see he puts a wave that almost goes over the top of the ship, but that's the way it was. I was in the North Atlantic on this ship for two years, and it was rough. But it's a particularly beautiful painting. I really love it. Some of the other paintings from World War II, here are uh, troop ships. You can see they were camouflaged. And he was on the committee that designed the camouflage for the ship. They had artists who were visually oriented to figure out what kind of the camouflage uh, should be uh, applied to each ship. Here are jeep carriers from World War II, uh, launching escort uh, airplanes for the fleet. Another very vigorous painting of destroyers. And here's a very famous painting by, it's called The Little Beavers. This is Arlie Burks. Uh, he was the commander of the Stedron, and uh, Admiral Burke later on became the chief of naval operations, became a close friend of my father's, and when my father passed, it was Arlie Burke who wrote the eulogy. More World War II uh, images, destroyers, again, you see this time it's camouflaged, and here is the cruiser Los Angeles on its maiden voyage, entering the harbor of Los Angeles. So we're at the end of the war now, and uh, uh, the uh, boat was on two ships primarily. The Los Angeles had just been launched. It had not been put into service, but it was on exercises down in Cuba, in Guantanamo Bay, Guantanamo Bay Cuba. And the other ship was the USS Midway. This was the first of our supercarriers built right at the end of the war. It did not see service in World War II, but he was on board this uh, right after the end of the war. This ship was significantly larger than any uh, aircraft carrier before, and you know that today it is a museum in San Diego Harbor. It still exists. So that was 1946. The, the war ends with the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and uh, the Navy realizes that the fleet is very vulnerable to this new weapon. The Navy did not know about the weapon. Very few people knew about the weapon or the power of it. So the Navy decided we have to have tests to find out how the ships will react to it. So here, li here lies the origin of the atomic bomb tests at Bikini Island in July of 1946. And the first bomb, this is a photograph of the first bomb. Bo was on this ship, and he had a quartermaster next to him, and he had a, 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 <coughs> he had a, a sketch pad, and he was trying to catch the shape of the cloud as it rose to 30,000 feet. So he's doing one sketch every five seconds, and the quartermaster is putting is timing it, so later on he can recreate the exact shape at a certain time. So here's the photograph, and here's the painting that resulted from it. This is the first painting of the atomic bomb. This is the bomb that was dropped by the Air Force from above on the Nevada as the target ship, which was painted red. This painting here is the second bomb. This is the Baker bomb. This was an underwater bomb. And you can see you, there's a, a tidal wave that's originated by this one. So here's the, uh, here's the fleet at Pearl Harbor. Now, the Navy intelligence had uh, Bo distort the spatial relationships between the ship. They were much spread out over a much greater distance than this. They are in the right locations, one to the other, but they are spread out with many uh, hundreds of yards between them. You'll see that in the photographs also. Uh, but he wanted to, and the, the, the Nevada is painted red because it was a target ship. Well, when the bomb was dropped, the Air Force was the one that dropped it, and they missed the target ship, and the Nevada survived uh, the bomb drop. So here you have it damaged but surviving, and here you have it at a night scene, again, uh, with ships burning in the background. And this is the way he painted plein air on a buoy with the ships burning around him, how he did these paintings. 
more paintings of the target fleet. <clears throat> There's a destroyer sinking, a Japanese destroyer sinking in the foreground. We took the old ships from World War II, both American, Japanese, and German, and that's what we dropped the bomb on. So here you have the Nevada, and in the background, that other uh, large conning tower, is the battleship Nag uh, Nagato. Nagato was the flagship the fleet of the Japanese fleet when it attacked Pearl Harbor, and we sank that ship at Bikini. Here's the USS Independence, uh, a small carrier, severely damaged by the blast. And here is the uh, submarine USS Skate. The Skate was uh, quite amazing in that the, it looks like it's quite seriously damaged there, but the pressure hull was not damaged at all, and the crew were able to get this uh, boat under underway and paraded in front of the Admiral in the flagship saying, we're still serviceable. But what they didn't take into account was how radioactive it was, and it was not good for those men to be on that boat at that time. So here's a photograph of the atomic bomb, this bomb, and you can see the spatial relationships of the ships now as they actually were. There's this painting. Here's a painting of the Nagato sinking. And at night, that same night, the Saratoga that you saw earlier launching biplanes, at the beginning of the speech, here there's the Saratoga going down a bikini. In, in the after war years, uh, Bo tra uh, traveled to China during the revolution. And he went to China on the USS uh, St. Paul, which was the flagship of the Seventh Fleet. There, here you have Chinese junks in the foreground. And when he went to China, he studied the Chinese scroll painters, and his watercolor style changed quite a bit. It became more subdued, his palette changed, and the, uh, the paintings became somewhat more contemplative. Here he is aboard the flagship, the St. Paul, that's the Admiral on the left, Admiral Delaney, Commander-in-Chief of the Seventh Fleet. And these are, this, this is a painting he did of the Imperial City in Beijing uh, when they were evacuating the American legation. Uh, he went up there and did this painting at just before the communists captured Beijing. Here's another painting of the Chinese uh, junks that he was particularly, uh, he gave this, this painting to me as a wedding gift. I particularly enjoy it. It's a beautiful watercolor. Here he is uh, at sea, painting a painting of the uh, St. Paul on board the St. Paul. And around the late 1950s, the early 1950s now, um, there's less demand for Navy paintings. There are not as many people in the service. The war is over. And uh, so he gets uh, some commissions that are civilian commissions. And here he is uh, painting a portrait, he's painting a, a mural, a 30-foot mural of the discovery of California by Cabrillo. And in the foreground there, the assistant there, that's my nephew, uh, John, who is the only one in the family who had the artistic talent that my father thought was good enough for him to be a studio assistant. He was the only one in the family who could do it. This is a picture of the, uh, of the entire mural. It's a 30-foot mural, and it, it's in the, in the Jonathan Club in Los Angeles today. More detail from that mural. In 1954, uh, the Navy is uh, working on the first nuclear submarine, the Nautilus, and uh, Bo was asked by the General Dynamics Division of, uh, or the Boat Division of, Electric Boat Division of General Dynamics, to do the first painting of, the, of a nuclear submarine. So he goes to Groton, Connecticut, and he paints this painting. Uh, he didn't think it was a very beautiful painting because it's, it doesn't show very much of the boat, but the fact is it was, the boat was so secret, it was covered with tarps, and, and they didn't want the Russians photographing it. But the significance of it was it was being commissioned by the sponsor was Mamie Eisenhower. So this painting was painted for Mrs. Eisenhower, and it went to the White House and as long as they were in the White House, it, it remained there. When they left the White House, they gave it back to the Nautilus. The Nautilus served as an active boat for 35 years. It's now retired. It's, uh, it's a museum in Groton. And the painting today is still there next to the photograph of Mamie Eisenhower with a bottle of champagne raised about to christen the Nautilus. So in the late 1950s, uh, Bo was invited by the Navy to, to go on expeditions to the Arctic and later on to the Antarctic. And in that regard, the first crossing by a deep water vessel from the Pacific Ocean through the ice to the Atlantic Ocean was done by a convoy led by a Canadian icebreaker. This is the Labrador. And the Labrador was, because they were in Canadian waters, it was the lead ship. But right behind it were American ships. You started in American waters, 
You went through Canadian waters and you ended in American waters. So they would change position. But these were the first ships to follow the route that Amundsen had, uh, had discovered. Uh, and it was, it was a difficult voyage because the, at that time there was still a great deal of ice there. It's not like it is today. So he did a whole series of paintings of the Arctic, that atmospheric paintings. And here's the flagship, the uh, Arnep. And here he is painting on the ice. And people say, well, how, how do you do a watercolor on the ice? Well, there's a story behind that. What he did, when he knew he was going to the Arctic, he went home one day, and we had a big freezer. And he opened the freezer, he told my mom, take everything out, I need to use this freezer. So then he put jars with water in it, a whole series of them, and he had alcohol. And he started mixing, very scientifically, different amounts of alcohol. At the mixture of 35% alcohol to 65% to water, the paint would still flow through the brush without crystallizing, and he could do a water, watercolor at 20 degrees below zero. So he experimented with that, and later on, here he is painting on the ice under those conditions, and that's how he did it. I don't think anyone else has done that. The next painting, this is a, this is a painting of, of a film crew by uh, a, f a famous uh, travel, a man who did travel logs. And uh, he uh, later on got to know the, the director quite, quite well. And the, the director invited him to come and lecture at the Explorers Club in New York. This painting is now in the Explorers Club collection. It shows the frogmen with their cameras doing a film of the ice. Bo particularly liked the ice, icebergs because he thought they were sculptures. And he painted many of them many times. Here is a, a, a merchant ship, a 100,000 ton tanker, that was equipped with an icebreaker hull that tried to go through the same route from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean that the Navy ships had taken. It was so severely damaged in the process. She had no oil on board because they were just testing to see what she could make it through with water. But she was so badly damaged, they decided it was not feasible to take oil from Alaska to the East Coast through the ice at that time. Here's Bo again painting out on the ice. And you can see uh, his, that's the glacier in the background. One of his, that was the ship that he was embar embarked on. These are American icebreakers. We're now in the Antarctic, in two expeditions to the Antarctic in 1960-61. Here he is painting on board. Uh, He's painting a picture of uh, some helicopters. And here's the painting that he did in the brig on board the, the glacier. This is a painting of uh, Sir Vivian Fuchs. Uh, he was a British explorer. And he, uh, his ship got caught in the ice, and the American ships had to go and rescue it. And here's some of the equipment they used to carry supplies from McMurdo Base to the South Pole, which was, was quite a distance away. South Pole, by the way, is at 9,000 feet. More paintings from the um, Arct Antarctic. And here is uh, Bo, this is a photograph of Bo painting the first painting of the South Pole. And this is the painting that exists. That is the physical pole, and that's Bo to the left of the pole. It's a self portrait there. This painting today is at the uh, Explorers Club in New York. In two weeks, I'm going to be giving a lecture there. I'll have the paintings uh, arrayed behind me. He loved painting the ice formations with the ships in the foreground, one of his favorite subjects. He did it many times. This is a painting from my collection. That's uh, Mount Erebus. Erebus is the largest mountain in the Antarctic. And this, this, uh, this is a volcano, so you can see it's uh, smoking there at the top. So I got a, a landscape and a seascape and an ice scape all in one. Here he is still doing work on board the uh, USS St. Paul. And here's the type of painting that he did. This painting was done in Japan. You can see Mount Fuji in the background. And when he was on board, he would always give uh, lectures to the crew and demonstration paintings. So here he is uh, doing a demonstration of watercolor. We got into the late 50s during the Cold War. They brought back the old battleships, put them back into service. And in 1961, he painted this painting of the USS Rochester. That's, uh, he did many paintings of, uh, of fast cruisers, but this one in particular was special. It was the year that John Kennedy was uh, 
inaugurated, and the governor of California, Pat Brown, who was Edward G. Pat Brown, the father of the current governor, came to the group at the Army Navy Club in Los Angeles, of which my dad was a member, and said, we need to have a, a gift to give to President Roosevelt, to President Eisenhower, President Kennedy. <laughs> he, gave, he was in all those collections, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, it's Kennedy is the right one. This is the USS Rochester, and the governor carried this painting uh, to Washington and delivered it to Kennedy at the inauguration. In later years, Bo did a, a painting of the PT-109. So here's a painting, a picture of a, a Bo in his studio. It's quite significant because you can see a painting partially completed. And here you have the aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy. In the foreground, you have the, crew, the uh, destroyer Joseph Kennedy. Both of these uh, ships never op they never operated together, but artistic license allows him to put these painting these ships together for the Kennedys. So there are the two Kennedys. That's the finished uh, finished uh, painting. More scene paintings of the aircraft carriers during the time. And this is a painting of a guided missile uh, uh, destroyer by the name of USS England. This painting was given to Queen Elizabeth and to Prince Philip when they, uh, they came to visit Long Beach and to see President Reagan in 1983. They took this painting on the Britannia back with them and it's now in the Royal Collection in London. These are uh, nuclear submarines done in the late 1960s during the Cold War. Uh, towards the end of, uh, of uh, his career, he began to, to paint sailing ships once more. He went back to it. And one of his famous ones was the uh, Coast Guard vessel Eagle. Here's a, painting, a finished painting of the Eagle, done in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And at the same time, he knew Walt Disney. He'd known Walt Disney since the days when he was at Chouinard Art Institute. And Walt was invited to come down and have a, uh, spend a day on the, on the Eagle. And he invited my dad to go along in his plane with him. So he flew down to San Diego. They took a helicopter out to the escort ship. And then they went by launch over to the uh, Eagle itself. Here's a picture of, of Bo on the deck of the Eagle with Walt Disney looking at his drawing and the captain of the Eagle. And this is the painting that was the resultant painting from that event. So you see the escort ships in the background. And uh, you can see the vigor of the seas again, which is one of his trademarks. So he also decided to expand his paintings of the historic ships leading up to the bicentennial in 1976, the 200th anniversary of the country. And he wanted to paint all the ships from the, the Revolutionary War and from the War of 1812. So we went back historically. The Navy sent him the rigging uh, designs of each of the ships so he, he could do it with authenticity. And he, would do, he did most of the ships that existed in the early Navy, including some battle scenes. This is a battle scene from the War of 1812 on Lake Champlain. This is a, a, a Navy, this is the first uh, American ship, to, a Navy ship, to go into the Antarctic. This is one of the largest ships in the Navy in the, in the War of 1812. And then he did paintings of the Constitution and the Constellation. And his last trip with the Navy, towards the end of his life, he's now 79 years old, and he's invited to go to Vietnam. The war is, uh, is not going well there, but uh, he's going to paint the Navy aspect of it. Uh, during the World War II, he was never allowed to go into a battle zone because he was a major part of Navy intelligence, Navy major part of uh, Navy public relations, it was too valuable to Navy, they didn't want to risk him. But in this case, he always wanted to go. So Admiral Leahy was no longer on the scene, and uh, he got the Admiral to give him orders, and he went to Vietnam. And here he painted the, the river boats on the Mekong River. And he painted the uh, escort ships interdicting the uh, Viet Cong supply lines off the coast, and the aircraft carriers that were launching the attacks on the mainland. And also the uh, hospital ship that was there to, uh, to take care of our wounded. So we're now at the very end of his career. One of the last things that happens is the Queen Mary arrives in Long Beach. So he did the last voyage of the Queen Mary. You'll see in the background, you'll see the uh, nuclear cruiser Long Beach in the background. And this image of the Queen Mary is a very famous image. It was adopted by Camille Cunard as part of their publicity. And it is entitled The Last Voyage of the Queen Mary. Now, you saw in the beginning of his career, the first Navy ship you saw was the carrier of Saratoga launching biplanes. One of the last paintings that he painted was the nuclear ship, the Enterprise. You 
can see the no smokestacks there launching the latest jets. So this is the scope of the technology that he started with, with ships that were burning coal and launching biplanes through the ships that burned oil during World War II, and at the end of it, the nuclear <coughs> submarines and nuclear carriers. And this is the last photograph taken of me with my dad when he was 86 years old at the opening of his retrospective exhibit. And that concludes the legacy of Arthur Beaumont. Thank you so much.